palace bell, embraced high style elements, including domes, stone columns, deep dentiled overhangs, and highly decorative cornices. So these are really more exuberant, um, but classical buildings. And then we have the true neoclassicals in Missoula and Livingston. Um, but they, they might not look as grandiose, but they have these wonderful big windows and grand entries. And so those were the first eight to be built. Um, they're all architect designed um, or master craftsman designed. Uh, and then things start to shift. By 1906, uh, Carnegie's library program and his other charitable projects consumed so much of his time that he increasingly turned to his longtime personal secretary, James Bertram to handle the details of the program. And Bertram created a stricter set of procedures for applicants with specific language for communities to use when establishing their local library funds and accepting the gift. Bertram also created guidelines for library design that favored simpler yet dignified construction and emphasized usable space and efficiency. And when you read about Bertram, there's not a whole lot, he was a very private man, who hid from the public like you wouldn't believe because every time he walked down the street, somebody asked him for money. Um, <laughs> so he was, yeah, so that's like the only picture around. Um, and I'm sorry, it's just a blow up of that uh, picture of the first meeting in the Carnegie Corporation. Um, so he was much more exacting and he wasn't a big fan of architects because he thought architects kind of built for their own edification rather for the, the people that would actually have to work in the building. And so he took his design ideas and his rules and regulations from professional librarians. All this kind of came together while the profession of librarianship was really coming to its fruition in the late 19th and early 20th century. And he embraced the librarians rather than the architects, much to the architects' frustration. <laughs> so each of the library in libraries in Montana's second wave displayed the architectural restraint advocated by Bertram, often and often necessitated by cost and the availability of materials. So beginning with the library at Glasgow, Montana, these Carnegie libraries featured brick veneer exteriors, centered entries set up by pilasters or columns rectangular footprints, flatter hipped roofs, modest cornices, and single stories atop daylight basements, the elements that would become hallmarks of the Carnegie classic architectural style. Main floors contained essential circulation desks, stacks, and reading rooms, while the basements housed space for an assembly or lecture room with separate access for room <coughs> entry. Mechanical rooms and restrooms were also typically in the basement. And so they, published these notes from the erection of library buildings. And if you look at the spelling of buildings, it's weird, B-I-L-D-I-N-G-S, <laughs> because as I said, Carnegie was kind of weird. And he strongly believed that the English language was ridiculous in <laughs> its use of too many vowels and consonants or whatever. And so he required his employees and himself to use a modified spelling system that he tried to get the whole country to adopt. Wow. So when you read all these letters from Bertram every time, buildings is spelled with no U. Wow. So it's not a joke. <laughs> um, so just looking at these floor plans real quick, these are, um, you know, if you go to most of the Carnegie libraries in Montana, you'll see one of these floor plans because he really was, um, very strict about it. And by the time they got Harvey was applying, you know, they wanted a they wanted a fireplace. It's like, oh, no, fireplace is but they really got into a fight, um, many, many letters back and forth because the librarians in Harvey wanted a wash sink for the children on the first floor because these grubby little kids kept coming in with their grubby little hands and messing up the books. And they thought, you know, this really needs to happen. And um, it took quite a bit of convincing before Bertram let them help. So actually, if you go to the one in uh, Bighorn County, they do have a wash sink in the first floor. It's just a tip. <laughs> so 
So these are just two of the ones that I picked out as having that absolute quintessential Carnegie Library style. You look at them and you know exactly what it is right away. You walk into the center vestibule, their reading rooms to either side, the um, circulation desk is right there in the, in the middle, and the librarian is presiding over it. Um, and if you go into many of these still have the original um, bookcases too, which are short. And that's because you wanted to be able to see those grubby kids with their grubby <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, there was the, the librarian was absolutely lord of the manor and um, had to be able to see everything that was going on. And so that's why you have those low bookcases. You'll also notice, and this isn't a good picture to tell you, but on the sides of these buildings, you'll notice that the windows are actually pretty high above. Um, they high up in the second story, and that's to accommodate even more bookcases. It was all about efficiency and design and making the best use of the space, um, even if it meant you didn't get a ton of natural light in the building. So I'm going to talk a bit about early Montana libraries. So books are heavy, they're fragile, they take up a lot of room. So you can see why they were a relatively rare commodity in the Rocky Mountain West during the 19th century, especially before the railroads. But sometimes they served an essential purpose. Mary Lowe Lewis and William Clark can't get through a lecture in Montana without talking about Lucy Clark. You know? <laughs> um, they traveled through the region with a library of scientific tomes, reference books, a history of Louisiana, and maps essentially to their core of the Sudbury's success. On May 14, 1905, Sacagawea famously saved many of the course books when one of the expedition's canoes overturned on the Missouri. Other explorers and fur traders also carried value, the valued volumes with them or sought them out once they came to the territory. Fort Mackenzie, near present-day Loma, Montana, boasted one of the state's very first libraries. Between 1833 and 1844, this collection, quote, contained a little of everything, science, history, poetry, and fiction. In 1861, the Stewart brothers famously rode 150 miles from the Deer Lodge Valley to the Bitterroot to purchase books from a collection there, paid $5 a piece. Two years later, John Mullen described the book collection at Fort Owen as, quote, the finest to be seen in the Pacific Northwest. As elsewhere in the United States, Montana's first libraries were accessed through membership or subscription. One of the first publicly accessible subscription libraries opened in Helena in 1868. Wrote one Helena resident, here, boy, they really verbose back then. Here where the allurements to vice are many, and intellectual entertainments few, where hundreds of men have leisure and little acquaintance, and the gratification of their desire to read is otherwise expensive. The establishment of a circulating library and the maintenance of cheerful reading rooms is fraught with manifold benefits to the entire community. <laughs> Fort Benton and Deer Lodge soon followed, and Bozeman called for a public library in 1872. As the population increased over the next several decades, community leaders across the territory established libraries. These institutions were often a simple room in a private home, but offered educational opportunities in the hope that young men would find them su a suitable life alternative to saloons, gambling, and brothels. <laughs> Local residents also believed that libraries might bring increased stability to their community. In 1883, the Montana Territorial Legislative Assembly empowered cities and towns to levy up to a one mill tax, so one dollar for every thousand dollars of property value, to quote, establish and maintain one free library for the use of its citizens. So this is just cities and towns. Several cities, including Helena, Butte, Dillon, Great Falls, Bozeman, and Glasgow, established library funds through taxation. The taxes paid for acquisition and maintenance, but most communities didn't have the money to construct a dedicated library building. There were exceptions. The William H. Coors Memorial Library in Deer Lodge, the Hearst Free Library in Anaconda, the Butte Public Library, and the Parmley Billings Memorial Library were all built with infusion of funds from wealthy local benefactors. And I do find it interesting that the Coors 
Library and the Parmley Library were gifts to the city in remembrance of um, the family's sons who both died in their 20s mm -hmm. unexpectedly. And so they thought the best way to memorialize their lost child was with a library. Um, and you might recognize the Parmley Billings Library is now the Western History Center in Billings. Uh, and the Coors Library is still a going concern at the library. Um, and we've got a great, very sympathetic addition to it. And if you haven't been in that building, it's really it's a treat. Other towns, however, house their collections in cramped city halls or rented rooms. Dylan's library existed in a, quote, miserable wooden shack. <laughs> and the Hamilton library smelled like the livery next door. <laughs> they really complained about the smell. Because they were in the city hall, and I love city halls that have um, fire, their firehouses attached to it, um, but they kept their horses in the fire hall, and literally the library room was right next door, and so it smelled really bad. By 1900, the pressing need for dedicated library buildings coincided with the rise of progressive era social organizations, a wave of new municipalities, and the availability of construction funds from Andrew Carnegie. In Montana, as in other states, women's clubs took up the task. Nationally, women's clubs had their origins as literary societies, and advocating for libraries was a natural extension of their mission. And this was true in Montana, where formal and informal groups of women from Missoula to Miles City and numerous communities in between, including the Fort Benton Women's Club pictured here, established book collections and reading rooms. And these ladies are just <coughs> remarkable. They were tireless in advocating for uh, a library building from Carnegie in Fort Bend. Um, and they were the first ones in when it was completed, and they held their first meeting um, that evening before the general public was allowed to go in, and they have met continuously in that same room ever wow. since for over 100 years. Um, as Montana's population mushroomed, these endeavors intersected with local government's desire to establish attractive civic institutions to bolster a sense of permanence. Andrew Carnegie's library program, dedicated to, quote, promoting the advancement and diffusion of knowledge and understanding among the people of the United States, proved well suited to accomplishing these goals. Often, women's clubs took the lead in garnering names on petitions corresponding with Carnegie and Bertram, and fundraising. In Montana, the early 1910s witnessed dramatic population increases, especially in the eastern part of the state, attributable to the opening reservation lands to non-Indian settlement, boosterism, and the passage of the enlarged Homestead Act of 1909. The Montana Library Association, established in 1906, promoted libraries in these areas. The 1915 county library law allowed residents to petition their county governments to levy up to two mills to maintain a library. Spearheaded by Gertrude Buckhouse, the university library in Missoula, and an MLA leader, the law gave Montana counties the authority to apply for Carnegie funds for the first time. Dedicated to the county library's program success and its potential to reach rural Montana, Buckhouse sometimes intervened with Bertram on the applicant's behalf. In fact, she's the one who convinced him to let her have their sink. <laughs> <laughs> Bertram respected her professional expertise and not only welcomed, but sought out her opinions and explanations. So it wasn't always Ms. Buckhouse that was writing to the Carnegie Corporation and asking for a special favor. If Bertram was in doubt, he would often write to her and say, you know, who are these jokers? Should I take them seriously? So um, she was really responsible for quite a few libraries in the state. <laughs> the flurry of settlement and construction that defined much of Montana's history through the turn of the 20th century came to a quick end by the late 1910s. Widespread drought began in 1917 and placed an enormous strain on the agricultural economy. After World War I ended in 1918, Speculative banking practices and the downturn of extractive industries, such as logging and mining, further contributed to the economic crisis in Montana during the 1920s. Montana was the only state to lose population between 1920 and 1930. <coughs>
depending on tax revenues, many local libraries struggled to stay fiscally sound through the 1930s. And in fact, several of them, those that were built in 1919, 1920, 1922, um, often could not open their doors. They would have the shell of the building complete. But I think Lewistown was one, not Lewistown, uh, Livingston. Um, they had to wait because they couldn't afford to put lights in. Um, and Hardin was another one. The, the Bighorn County uh, Library was open to the public only in the afternoons, but they had to close it when it was dark because they couldn't afford to put lighting in for several years. Despite these challenges and often with the steady support of local women's clubs, Montana's 17 Carnegie Libraries remained open and steadily increased their collections and outreach efforts. Their services included branch libraries, rural delivery, and special children's programming. During the Great Depression, local public libraries functioned as information hubs where farmers could learn about new agricultural methods and techniques. They also served and continue to serve as community gathering places. For rural patrons, the arrival of a book truck or an excursion to the library in town offered respite from troubled times and the opportunity to connect with others. Montana libraries' fortunes improved the rest of the economy following World War II. In 1949, the MLA successfully petitioned the legislature to fund the Montana State Library Commission, or the SLC, and that was a team of professional librarians who supported local libraries by loaning books, providing field visits and trainings, and responding to librarians' inquiries for help and advice. Still, by 1954, approximately one-fourth of Montana's population <coughs> lacked access to library services. That year, the legislature authorized a state library extension commission dedicated to founding new libraries, improving established libraries, and aiding in the establishment of traveling libraries. <laughs> in Montana, <coughs> the extension commission administered programs funded in part by the National Library Services Act of 1956 a landmark piece of legislation that offered funding for collections, staff, equipment, interlibrary loan, and bookmobile programs. It also supported the development of library federations, multi-county cooperative organizations that allowed libraries to share their resources. Pictured here is the Five Valleys Bookmobile. The Missoula Public Library was a leader in traveling libraries and even loaded boxcars full of books to be used at logging camps. This one is from 1926. While the Library Services Act helped advance Montana's library programming, the 1964 Library Services and Construction Act stimulated the physical transformation of many of the state's libraries, including those originally constructed with Carnegie support. The federal program provided matching funds to material increase and improve libraries' capacity to serve. Miles City and Custer County really took advantage of this program in 1965 to pay for an extensive remodel in addition, unfortunately, to the front of their original 1903 Carnegie building. The same year, Carnegie, or I'm sorry, Glasgow and Great Falls both demolished their Carnegie libraries and constructed new facilities. By 1981, Kalispell, Missoula, Malta, Chinook, sorry, and Bozeman had abandoned their Carnegies for new accommodations. The remaining eight Carnegie libraries underwent upgrades, expanding collections and programming, improving accessibility, building additions, and accommodating new technologies. Many of these changes were respective of the original building's design and preserved their historic and architectural integrity. One of those was Bozeman's. <laughs> You guys know the history of Bozeman. I know the history of Bozeman. <laughs> <laughs> we all talked it. You know, there's John Bozeman. He tried his hand at mining, first in Colorado, and then what would become Montana Territory, and that was little success. Just three years into his odyssey in 1863, he decided to uh, carve a new, more direct route to the diggings and establish the Bozeman Trail. Their excursion ended at Deer Creek Station on the Emigrant Trail, and so it followed. Uh, Deer Creek Station and then carved its way up. Most of the immigrants had to follow the Emigrant Trail, which kind of vaguely follows um, where the Union Pacific is down here, and they would have to turn up 
in the middle of Utah and go up to the bridging city that way. So both John Bozeman decided to go to hypotenuse. <laughs> The only in service for two years before Red Cloud's war and the subsequent treaty at Fort Laramie closed it, the Bozeman Trail had a big impact on the development of Montana territory. Thousands of immigrants traversed the route, coaxing miners, trappers, farmers, entrepreneurs, and families to the region. From the beginning, Bozeman understood the potential of the Gallatin Valley for development. Before leaving to guide his first successful train across the trail, he conspired with Daniel Rouse and William Eel to found a town just where the trail ended on the east side of the valley, situated to swallow up all the tender feet as they arrived from the east. <laughs> when he arrived to the immigrants in August 1864, he, Beal, Rouse, and nine others officially established the town of Bozeman. Within three years, the community and the man had flourished. Successful harvests led to construction of mills and ditches, and Nelson Story famously brought cattle from Texas. In 1867, John Bozeman was murdered, blamed on the Blackfeet, the killing factored into the establishment of Fort Ellis just northeast of town, and the influx of soldiers invigorated the city for, by providing customers trade and security. So it's going concern. By 1872, and there's even a Gallatin Bar Association in that year. And that year, the Avant Courier, the newspaper was already established, uh, lauded the idea of the Gallatin Bar Association establishing a library. They say, a public library is a necessity that no town that can afford it should be without. It will give our boys and young men some place besides the saloon and the gambling house to spend their evenings and leisure hours, in storing their minds with useful instructions. Every citizen in Bozeman should contribute liberally to this laudable enterprise. Fundraising concerts and public meetings ensued, Community leaders founded the Young Men's Association, which was a national model for subscription <coughs> libraries. Um, by the way, fun fact, uh, Benjamin Franklin, did you know this? And Benjamin Franklin established the first public library as a subscription mm -hmm. library. Um, that enterprise is still in business. It's called the Library Company of Philadelphia, and he established that in 1731. Mm -hmm. so those are fun facts. <laughs> um, there, the shareholders pooled their money to purchase and share access to books. The same idea evolved into a subscription libraries, and during the 1800s, young men's associations often took up the cause of developing subscription libraries in their communities. They consulted with other communities, including inquiries to Helena's successful library association. Opening first from a storefront on Main Street, Bozeman's YMA, not the YMCA, but the YMA, opened their own meeting hall and reading rooms in the newly constructed brick business block on January 20th, 1873. The library then has newspapers and more than 140 books, with many more in route, and boasted 90 members. Decorated with antlers from elk, deer, and moose, members describe the YMA library as a very enticing place to weave and smoke. <laughs> S. Cook, quote, a young man of courteous demeanor, unquote, was appointed librarian in April 1873 and replaced by H.R. Four. In September of that year, ladies were invited for membership. Yay. <laughs> Though their presence would be restricted to the afternoon hours for a few days a week, while the gentlemen were permitted only in the evenings on Thursdays and Saturdays. <laughs> no fraternization. <laughs> To the YMA's frustration, even inviting women to partake of membership and hosting benefits did not make the library sustainable. The Panic of 1873 and subsequent economic depression took its toll on Bozeman and its institutions. The much anticipated Northern Pacific <laughs> Railway halted construction just before it reached here. Agricultural prices fell and banks failed. Despite a regular schedule of events, lectures, and meetings at Library Hall, the association voted to disband in December 1875. Three board members, S.W. Langhorn, C.L. Clark, and A.D. McPherson, were entrusted with the books while the rest of the property was sold to the highest bidder. Judge J.V. Bogert presented alternative solutions to try and keep the library open, including it opening it up to schools, but to no avail. Bogert eventually took possession of the books 
and offered them from his office at a cost of 25 cents per month. By the March of 1878, the cost had dropped to just 50 cents a year. And by September, the Bozeman Avant Courier lamented that the YMA's hundreds of books were not used. By 1884, the YMA's library collection could be found at the public school. That year, despite the YMA trustees and school board's reservations, the newly formed Young Men's Christian Association, or YMCA, worked to obtain YMA's funds and inventory. Like their predecessors, the YMCA, supported by community-minded women who served as part-time librarians and volunteers, offered reading rooms and later circulation privileges on a subscription basis. In 1886, the Avant Corridor called on the city's residents to take an interest in the library, then located in the old Monroe Building. I do this all the time. They refer to a building's name and never their address. <laughs> so it's very difficult to figure out, and they don't have folk directories from that year, so I couldn't figure out where the old um, Monroe Building was. But I do know that it was at the corner of Main and Tracy. And there is only one brick, two-story building on the corner of Main and Tracy by 1884, and that's that pink one there, kind of in the center. Um, so I'm guessing that that's where the library was. We'll all pretend that that's where the library was. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, this philanthropic enterprise deserves the hearty support of every citizen interested in the good, the morals of our boys and young men, it's always men that we're worried about, right? <laughs> Who in these rooms acquire a taste for choice reading matter. The 300 volume library soon became accessible to every Bozemanite for free, it's, but its popularity waned. You guys just don't like reading. <laughs> By the fall of 1888, no one could pull the library out of its, quote, slew of despond, and it finally closed in October of 1888. Placed in Judge L.A. Luce's office for safekeeping, a fire engulfed much of the collection just six months later. The remnants of the library, about 250 volumes, moved to a donated space while members of the public, particularly women's groups, rallied to keep the library accessible. Despite the loss of the library, 1889 proved a heady time for Bozeman's cultural scene. That year, Montana became became a st state in search of a capital, forgive me. Bozeman lobbied for the honor, introducing a wave of development that focused on both commercial and civic enterprises. Among the new ed edifices stood City Hall, which functioned as a cultural center as well. Upon completion in 1890, the building housed not only government <coughs> offices, police, the fire department, and I assume the horses, but also <laughs> an opera house and Bozeman's library. The following year, the populace voted for a half mill levy to support the library. This investment allowed it to flourish for the first time, and subsequent years witnessed the collection's expansion to nearly 5,300 volumes by 1900. <clears throat> a victim of its own success, the massive collection began to overtake the cramped rooms at City Hall. Librarian Belle Christman made inquiries about the new, a new building and she received encouraging news and instruction from Great Falls' library staff, who were in the process of, and of obtaining and constructing a Carnegie Library as well. The Bozeman City Council's Library Committee, chaired by J.M. Lindley, and you can kind of see maybe his signature down at the bottom, I said, forgive me, these papers were very difficult to copy. Um, so Lindley worked with Chrisman, and a city clerk named C.M. Pierce and applied to Carnegie on October 30th, 1901. Carnegie's secretary, James Bertram, responded encouragingly, asking for more details and clarifications. Because Bozeman had a tax-supported library in place, the application process went very, very smoothly. And on March 14th, 1902, Bertram promised Bozeman $15,000 for a building provided the city increase its library tax to provide at least $1,500 per year in monetary support, and that the city obtain a property building lot. The city acted quickly. In April 1902, the library levy increased to one mill, allowing for approximately $2,000 a year dedicated to library expenses. But, nothing's ever easy. Finding an appropriate parcel fell into the city's overall development concept. 
of placing civic and cultural values in strategic places. The City, the city Beautiful Movement's mantra, and the City Beautiful Movement kind of started with the Chicago's World Fair uh, in 1892, and it was the white city and these wonderful architectural masterpieces that were all gleaming white in neoclassical revival styles. And from that came this idea of City Beautiful, where if you build beautiful things and you have beautiful parks in strategic locations, people will behave themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and so where did those men want to put their library? They wanted to put their library next to the female boarding establishments. <laughs> so if you look at the very top of this uh, map uh, of Maine and Bozeman, and then Mendenhall's right above, between Maine and Mendenhall, as Crystal knows very well, mm -hmm. <laughs> was another slew of despond. It was the brothels. And so they thought if they put a big, beautiful building where people could read instead of fooling around, that they would go <laughs> and choose to read. <laughs> Which they kind of did. So the Carnegie Library eventually was built right up here. And then these are all our female boarding establishments. And this is the Opera House. So we wanted to have these nice hotels and cultural centers strategically placed to push out the uh, nefarious people. <laughs> <laughs> so Christman was also, in addition to being a librarian, she was a member of the um, Women's Christian Temperance Union. And so she had a lot of influence about the placement of the, of the building itself. And she thought that um, the location that they chose was prime for this social experiment. <laughs> They believed that the library's presence would entice young men to choose enlightenment over carnal pleasures. Indeed, the YMA and the YMCA's libraries had touted the ability of the library to offer alternative forms of recreation. So who did they choose to build it? They chose Charles Hare, and Charles Hare um, was becoming something of a library specialist. He's one of the most important architects in the state of Montana, he eventually partners with Gustav Link, and the firm of Link and Hare designed the majority of courthouses, the wings on the Capitol, lots and lots of very important monumental buildings across the state. Um, and Hare designed four of Montana's first Carnegie libraries. The one in Dillon, remember the one that looks kind of like a church? With all that wonderful stone. Um, he had just built the Parmley Library in Billings, and the Parmley Billings Library, um, which is also that kind of Renaissance revival heavy stone. And so what I think is that he kind of cheated and took some design elements from the Billings Library and implemented them in Dillon. And it kind of looks like a church, and that might be because the chief proponent for a library in Dillon was uh, Reverend and Mrs. Hooker, who lived in Dillon, and so, and the church, groups in Dillon were very much a part of that movement as well. So that's why I kind of think it looks like a church. But, um, so that was his first one. He also designed Miles City, Great Falls, and of course this wonderful building that you have in those places. Hare enjoyed a flourishing career designing many types of buildings. Um, but for Bozeman, he envisioned an elaborate edifice reminiscent of a Greek temple. And in keeping with the city beautiful's espousal of classically inspired architecture, the Bozeman Library's modified Greek cross footprint, pedimented grand entry supported by Doric columns. You have to remember your architecture, your history of art days. <laughs> Doric columns are the ones that aren't very fancy at the top. They're the capital. Um, balanced fenestration, you know what fenestration is? I love the word fenestration. And the first time I ever heard about it was in a very Catholic uh, high school, and we were talking about the defenestration in Prague. And I loved that idea of throwing somebody out the window, and it had so many. <laughs> so fenestration is the windows, of course, and all the openings and balance. Fenestration means that it basically, if you cut this building in half lengthwise, or from front to back, it would mirror each other. Um, and it's coining, which are those kind of lighter colored bricks on the corners, 
Um, it really does look a lot like Great Falls design as well. The Great Falls had a big round dome, and the one in Bozeman has a pyramid, <coughs> pyramidic dome in the middle. But here's the comparison. So this is a side view of the Carnegie Library in Bozeman. And you can see there was a front entry, the main hall that, had, that opened all the way up to the ceiling. The clear story windows allowed light to come into the center part of the building. And then it had this fan appendage. It still does. You can still go there. Um, it just isn't a library. Um, and this fan area held the stacks. So this was actually a closed stack system, or at least partially. Um, and the librarians wouldn't let you go back there. You have to get permission to go back there. Um, and the same idea, the same layout was in the Great Falls Library. Great Falls got $30,000 to build there, so theirs was a little bit bigger and had a more fancy dome. Um, and then the other one with the fan is Lewistown. It has one of those wonderful fan um, appendages on the back that help with stacks. So on the interior of the towers, clear story illuminated the central lobby, while tall double-hung windows provided natural lights to the wings, reading rooms, and stacks. A daylight basement provided additional meeting space and storage. Harris Design won the bid, and construction uh, commenced within a year. The grand dedication ceremony was on January 22, 1904, and began at the old library space, oops, I'm getting ahead of um, in City Hall and moved to the, an open house within the new building. 15 years later, librarian Geneva Cook inquired to the Carnegie Corporation about funding for a county library. So by now, the county library the law has passed, the Allison County runs in on the action. Um, wishing to take advantage of the recently passed county library law, both the city and county officials were anxious to establish a library, but required financial aid to do so. Unfortunately for the county, by the spring of 1919, the Carnegie Corporation had ceased their library building program, citing conditions created by the war. Um, so it wasn't so much that they ran out of money as that Andrew Carnegie ran out of heart. He was, um, for all his oddities, like he, he promised his mother he wouldn't get married until she was dead and then married his wife the day his mother died. <laughs> But um, he had some really kind of good ideas, and one of his other major gift-giving campaigns was for international peace. And when World War I started, and he wasn't, it was just out of control, and he became very depressed, um, and really turned control over his entire fortune to the Carnegie Corporation. He tried to broker peace, he went to Scotland, um, and tried to meet with the heads of the world uh, to no avail. So by 1919, he was pretty much done and wasn't going to give anybody any more money, um, at least for libraries. The Bozeman Public Library remained a city institution and served the public from its kindly funded building for 80 years. It provided not only reading materials and reference services, but also regular reading space for civic groups. Public programs, including lectures and children's reading hours, were regularly scheduled. But by 1979, the library's collections began to overtake the space. The building's capacity to accommodate a growing population, additional programming, computer technology, and digital services proved particularly challenging. And the city's residents voted to have a new library constructed um, a few blocks away on East Lamy Street and a brigade of volunteers hand-carried the library books to the new library designed by George Madison on July 14, 1981. City offices ever took the Carnegie Building, but accessibility issues and deferred maintenance led, to this, led the city to consider demolition by the mid-1990s. Good news is. Yay! Some years. <laughs> Fortunately, local preservation supporters rallied to save it. Attorneys Mike Puck and Mike Wheat purchased the old library and undertook an extensive yet sensitive rehabilitation. It still functions as the Cox Kinsler PLLC law offices. The sensitive rehabilitation kept many of the original details in place and even recreated, recreated the central reception desk to appear as the original. Mm -hmm. 
your new library. <laughs> well, the old, the 81, is an architecturally subtle yet modern building set on a tranquil, heavily landscaped creekside parcel, and it grew at a frenetic pace. As collections, programming, and technology expanded, the library again became cramped. In a familiar pattern, city offices overtook the building when a new library opened in November 2006. Reminiscent of the Carnegie Library, don't worry, I'll get you there. Reminiscent of the Carnegie Library. <laughs> the new space was constructed in a prominent location with an imposing yet welcoming edifice. Nearly 10 times as large as Harris new classical revival 1904 design, the thoroughly modern building was built to accommodate Bozeman's rapidly expanding population with high-tech services and equipment while retaining a sense of warmth and dedication to public service. When completed in 1904, Bozeman's Carnegie Library constituted the first standalone library building in the city. While a relatively accessible library served the city, at least intermittently since 1872, Carnegie's gift established the library as a definitive cultural institution. Safe from demolition 90 years after its construction, the Bozeman Carnegie Library building continues to contribute to the city's architectural landscape and to remind the public of the community's long-standing commitment to cultural and educational enrichment. So to sum up, determined efforts by local groups and individuals fostered the construction of Montana's Carnegie Libraries. And I just love this lady. I'm gonna tell you about a lady from Chinook. Her name was Hazel Allison Pasma. And she was one of the Women's Club members across the state who actively worked to obtain funding from Carnegie. She and her colleagues gathered names on petitions, wrote letters and newspaper articles, fundraised, secured land donations, and encouraged their elected officials to follow through on the applications. And she tells this one story in this great memoir of she had just arrived in Chinook, young, she's 21, she didn't know anybody, and thought, oh, I'll go to the women's club. And she went to the women's club within a week of her arriving there, and they said, oh, yes, you can be on our committee. You can be on the building lot committee and secure the land. And she said, okay. And he said, you're the only one on the committee. <laughs> <laughs> so she had to go. And they said, we think that the town, the guy found the town, we think he might want to do it, but he's really scary. He's really mean. So just be prepared that he's a really mean guy. And so she tells the story of just shaking, going to knock on the door to ask him if he would donate lots. <coughs> and he stomped around and didn't look at her while she was making her plea for, please, we need a library in town, won't you give us these lots you never use on Main Street? He wouldn't look at her and just stomped and reached in a drawer and looked like he was doing paperwork, and he turned around, signed it, and it was the deed to the lots. <laughs> and he had, the, she said, he had the biggest grin on his face. <laughs> and when they finally dedicated it, he said no one celebrated more than, when, uh, than he did when they opened the library. <laughs> so that he was really a nice guy. You just had to get to know him. <laughs> um, but she also talked about the process of getting county commissioners to do anything. And this is not a new phenomenon. <laughs> um, so what they had to do to establish a county library, according to county library law, is that they had to get the majority of people in the county to sign a petition saying, yes, we want to be taxed for a library. And so their plan was, they went on country roads, they went on no roads by horse and wagon on foot all over Blaine County, a big county, and gathered the petitions, usually from the women who were home. And then what happened was they brought the petitions to the county and they said, you know, oh, they don't match exactly, or she's not the taxpayer on this property, her husband is, you have to do it all over again. And when they went back to do it all over again, you know, several, most of the women were told, I, I was told I can't sign it, I'm not gonna sign it. So they really had to scrounge and scrounge and scrounge to do it, and she wrote about that. And she said, it seemed like a colossal task for such a small group of women to undertake, but we were told by the Carnegie people, if we could secure a plot of ground and a means of support, maintenance, etc. After it was built, they would put up a building. Or if we maintain it after it was built, they would put up a building for us. 
Likewise, women's clubs, librarians, community leaders, donors, voters, builders, and architects worked together to construct the 17 Carnegie Public Libraries across Montana between 1902 and 1922. The librarians worked and continue to work to serve their communities as critical sources of information. Librarian Leanna Olmsted wrote this great little poem. So I'm going to read you a close little poem. They asked for a book, the name quite absurd, the queerest title you've ever heard. One word of the title they seem to recall. They seem to recall the rest of the name they don't know at all. The book they say they think is read. It's about this big by a man who's dead. They don't know the author and don't know the name, but insist on having the book just the same. <laughs> Today, Montana's 15 surviving Carnegie libraries represent a long-term commitment to education, social improvement, and civic responsibility of its early, early citizens. Nine of Montana's Carnegie libraries continue to serve their communities as public libraries. Three provide alternative cultural experiences as art venues. Two contribute to their locality by providing office space, while one in Malta awaits rehabilitation, and it's dear. And if anybody just feels like investing, <laughs> go to Malta, it needs a roof. <laughs> oh, it's so great. Which one's, Malta is the second from the list of the top story, and it's got this wonderful family. It's just a beautiful building. So why wouldn't you want to go to Malta? It's awesome. <laughs> so these Carnegie libraries stand as cultural and architectural reminders that local history is connected to statewide and national events, programs, and trends while also reflecting their community's identity and our common heritage. And that's my talk.